And the problem with that is you're not solving their problem, right? You throw a tantrum, the sun comes up the next day and you look like an idiot, right? Because all your fury has gone and everything like that. And you still got to get this thing fixed, right? So I've learned over time that to be calm and to try and fix things, uh, I'm the first person to admit when I've screwed up, right? Because then you don't have that. You don't have that back and forth. You just go, oh, man, dude, I, I, I totally forgot I was supposed to do that scene first. My fault. Good. Conversation's over. Go fix that, right? Um, the less uh, – I always look at it this way. Everybody's got a million things going on. If I can take one of the things off their plate, right? So if Bruce doesn't have, doesn't have to worry about storyboards, my job's done. Director doesn't have to worry about storyboards, my job's done because they got to worry about a thousand other things. And you see how stressed they get out. Have you only ever thought about making art and nothing else? Maybe you have a non-art job and wonder is it even possible to switch to a full-time art career? Life often has other ideas and many things can get in the way. But for our next guest, it was simply a career in art and nothing else. And since having that epiphany, he has gone on to become one of the leading storyboard artists in the industry. Therefore, I'm delighted to welcome storyboard and visual development artist, Dan Milligan, who will simply inspire you in this episode. So let's go. Okay, let's go. Um, hey everyone, welcome back to the Lensquared podcast. And I'm delighted to bring on our first guest of the year, Dan Milligan. Welcome, Dan. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Great to, great to be here. I'm so excited to speak to you um, for many reasons. Obviously, one of the biggest reasons is your amazing body of work. And what I'm sure is an amazing career behind or whatever's driving all of that as well. Um, but for, because we had a lot of, guests and a lot of new I guess students and artists coming on um checking out the podcast and everything's kind of like fresh and new to everybody right. so um if you wouldn't mind giving the guests a, a lovely intro as to who you are um god okay I'll, I'll give you my um as you like to say my origin story so um yes. uh I'm, I'm I'm born and raised in Toronto I live just outside of Toronto I live about 15 minutes outside but uh I went to art college uh, here in Toronto. I went to the Ontario College of Art and Design. Um, I was a terrible student. Um, in fact, I almost uh, got thrown out. Um, true story. Um, I, was, I was being asked to leave because I was delinquent and I wasn't doing projects. And um, I'm going to try and truncate this. But to save my scholastic career, I took a, um, a summer course in storyboarding for two credits. And that is how I got into storyboarding. I suddenly, I suddenly found that like, I kind of like that. And, um, cause I'm, I'm very impatient. I'm not a great learner. Um, and storyboarding is all about being fast and drawing from your head. Mm. And that kind of put me on this course. So I managed to get through school. In fact, I did really well after that. And, um, and then right out of school, like while I was still in my fourth year, I got a job at an ad agency, a big, big Toronto ad agency. And uh, I was an in-house storyboard artist there. Um, and it was good. Um, you know, I had somewhere to go every day. I uh, had a paycheck. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have any mentorship. I was the only storyboard artist there. Um, right. So it was kind of, I was kind of had to use the, the sort of the community of storyboard artists in Toronto as, as my sort of sounding board. We all learned together. Um, and then after I was there for about a year and a half, and I decided I was going to go freelance. And they proposed to me, this agency, they're called Ogilvy. They used to be Ogilvy and Mather, but Ogilvy is a big worldwide agency. They said, um, mm -hmm. they said, well, why don't you run your business out of our studio? You, we'll give you autonomy. We'll give you, we'll give you a, um, a studio space. And in return, I would give them a, a, a discount on the work. Um, and Aaron, it was a fantastic relationship because I had, um, I had a social life, like had all these people around me. I think the agency at the time had about 300 people in it, maybe, maybe more. So, um, and, and I was able to freelance and do whatever, whatever I, uh, whatever other jobs I did. And plus I had this constant source coming right in the door. Like they were literally outside my door. So, so I, I really cut my teeth in advertising 
And um, over time, my work started getting noticed on the production side of advertising. So when you do when you do work for ad agencies, it's all about the concept. It's not about the execution. Mm-hmm. You know, you're you're trying to sell an idea to whoever your client is. Um, but then I started getting calls from production companies where they wanted storyboards that were informative, like how we're going to shoot this and whatever. So I started meeting directors that way. And so that moved me into production storyboarding, um, which I liked, I liked better because I felt like I was learning something, right? Like production storyboards are about information. Advertising storyboards are about influence, right? Like you, when you do, when you do production boards, it's, and I know I'm going off on a tangent here. It's really so about, it's really about the instructions on how to make a film or, or whatever you're doing, a cinematic. When you do storyboards for advertising, you're, you're trying to, inf- you're, you're trying to influence somebody to buy that service or buy that product. So there's all these really weird, um, sort of aspects that go into it. Like, you know, don't show that because the demographic is from 18 to 25 and you, you know, you have all these other factors yeah, yeah, yeah. layering on that goes into you're trying to influence people so um yeah so i, I did a lot of commercial um, um production work and then that just led into a film and game like like i i used to do i did some production commercial production with zach snyder that's how i met zach and then eventually off to do feature film so that's kind of a nutshell in my uh, on my my career so sort of school advertising into film, into games, and uh, here I am. <laughs> Dude, that's an that's an epic origin story. Um, especially like how you kind of got into storyboarding was almost like not a survival thing, but it's almost like a kind of like a last chance or a last gasp. So was that like in in high school? So like were yeah. you a teenager then? Yeah. Um, what I found that whenever I, I and I don't talk often because um, I'm you know I, frankly I don't know if I'm that interesting. But what I find, if, especially if I'm talking to students, what what they really like to hear from me is like, I went through the same thing in high school. I was in an art program. I was one of the art kids. Like my school had a great art program. And I started failing in that just because I'm an idiot, right? It's because you're whatever, you're 16 and, you know, you're just a jerk, right? Um, and the same thing happened. I, got, I had this epiphany that this is kind of... It was kind of a combination of what I wanted to do, but it was the only thing I could do. Like academically, again, not a very smart person. That's my wife. She's seen my report card from school. So um, um, I think what happened is my, the biggest thing I'd learned when, when I was in college, I was telling you I was getting thrown out of school, was that I was worried that I was going to if, if I turned work in or if I got proper critiques on my work, it was going to break this facade I had built up that I was pretty good. And if, if I wasn't handing things in, then that sort of image wouldn't be broken. I mean, Aaron, how stupid is that, right? And once I learned that it's okay to be shitty, it's okay to hand in bad projects, it's okay to be human, then I started to learn. Then once I got rid of all that, that, that baggage, right, of trying to be something that I, that I wasn't. And, um, and yeah, so then, then I just started to, to just put in the effort, put in the work and I'm not always a hundred percent focused. I am not, um, I'm not an example of some of your guests where, man, they are razor sharp and constantly moving forward. There are days where I lay on the couch and stare in the ceiling. <laughs> um, I do dumb stuff. I will watch really, really bad television. Um, but somehow I just keep sort of moving forward, right? And somehow I just sort of keep trying to be critical of myself and try to try to figure out how I can make myself better or offer more to my to my clients. And uh, so it's been really seat of the pants, really, more than anything. Wow. That, I definitely appreciate your honesty in that. And what you just said, because it's honest, it's, um, it's I think it's really powerful because I'm definitely in your category like not exactly the same but there's a lot of experiences that I can look back and thinking oh I did the same thing or I went for the same thing and even what you mentioned about I guess like uh, not so much work ethic but productivity like I I've learned that I can't defeat procrastination so I'll find a way to kind of maneuver around it 
yeah. um, while still kind of tend to doing it. And even something you just mentioned there about um, breaking that kind of like facade and image. I yeah. did that at university for the first couple of years where like I was a bit confused. I was like, okay, um, I don't know what it was. I'm still trying to unpack what that was, but I did a lot of that where I wasn't handing stuff in. Yeah. I was kind of like, oh, well, let's just, let me, I'll figure out the end, then I'll show it and it's going to be great. And it all fell apart. Yeah. But then that kind of moment where you realize that, you know what, let's just look at things properly. Let's just accept where things are and then go forward. And look at, at the time, it was a sh- shitty feeling. But looking back now, it was like, that was the best thing ever. Yeah. Um, and I definitely speak to a lot of people. I have spoken to a lot of people who allude to that or mention that in their own journey as well. And hearing that, especially like, you know, the career that you have, and it's like spectacular that you don't need to have necessarily the, 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 I guess the perfect resume in terms of process and behavior and all those different things, right? Like you can still reach a high level. Um, But is that something that kind of like has haunted you in the past, maybe thinking that if things didn't go that way, then where would you be now kind of thing? Um, Yeah, like I would say that, um, still to this day, um, I will be laying in bed at night, um, staring up at the ceiling and going, my whole business plan was to draw stuff. And hopefully someone will call me tomorrow and ask me to draw a picture. Yeah. Like Aaron, like it's the most insane, like my neighbors are like one guy's like a uh, mergers and acquisition guy. The other guy's a, a corporate tax lawyer. They all have real jobs. Right. And, yeah, and, yeah. and they, in a resume, it would be super impressive if I had to go to somebody to invest in my business and I wrote down what my business was, it would be a stranger needs to email me and ask for a picture. <laughs> I will draw that picture and they will pay me for it. That's it. And there are some, you know, throughout the year, you have some chilling nights where you go like, what was I thinking? But all these years later, it's it's still worked out, and and despite everything, uh, I I love it in that that passion. I think is what it, it pays dividends, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, like I tell my like I was telling you off camera, you know, my kids are are, are writers and musicians, and I constantly tell them they're going to have like really shitty days, like super shit days where you're going to question everything. But I said the real test is you wake up the next morning and you just go back at it again because you're insane. And um, <laughs> that's, the, that's the true test if you can do it, right? If you can just get the shit kicked out of you, um, on, on personally, like you do it to yourself, right? Because um, you're your own worst enemy. But if you just, the next day, whatever, you pick up that pencil and start drawing or the tablet, um, then you're going to be fine, right? And then you're going you're, you're, you're gonna, to you're gonna be fine. You're supposed to feel crappy. Art, is, art will heart, break your heart for sure. Dude, that is, again, that's like, we've had so many put it on your t-shirt moments already from what you've just dropped. So that's definitely going to be on one of them. Um, And I I think that's like really powerful, just and simple as well. Like you just have to just keep going. And I guess that's not saying that like, you know, if not take a rest, because that's, I guess, one thing, like I'm sure you've had the same thing, just burning out and just like pushing when maybe kind of just take a bit of a break, but taking a break is not stopping. And, you know, you want to keep going forward. Um, But you mentioned about like, you know, those, those days and those moments where you're just kind of like almost defeated, right? Like, you know, Neo, Agent Smith takes you out. um, But this time you don't rise up and you don't see the matrix. You just kind of stay on the floor. Um, Like how many, I guess, have you had? You mentioned the one where if it wasn't for taking up storyboards, I guess that could be one. But like, are there any others that kind of really stand out to you that have really kind of like, put things in perspective i guess yeah well when 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 i that whole moment when i was when i was asked to leave art college um funny enough i was take i had also taken a photography class and it wasn't because i was interested in photography but at the time i wanted to be able to shoot my own reference um you know i should backtrack before i before i um i had plans of being an illustrator Right. Mm-hmm. It was going to be magazine covers and book covers. Um, I wasn't really, I didn't know a whole lot about storyboarding. And so I wasn't going to photography class because I wasn't interested and my whole life was spiraling out of control. And my photography teacher, God love him. He found me like on campus and he said, he sat me down. He goes, you know, he goes, you don't have to be here. 
He goes, this isn't like grade school anymore or high school anymore. He goes, you're paying money to be here. If you don't want to be here, don't come. He goes, we just assume you're here because you want to be here. And I remember, I remember going home after talking to him going, yeah, like I kind of, I remember when that was my goal was to get into that school. And, um, and now here I am not even taking advantage of it. And that really resonated with me. I had kind of forgotten what I was doing, right? I was so concerned about protecting, again, this facade that I thought I was, right? Because, I mean, I'm a pretty insecure person, but I have, we're all egocentric at the same time, right? We, we see the world through, you know, we're the, we're the center of it, right? So I always believed other people thought I was better than I was. And, um, you know, that sort of imposter syndrome, you know, mm -hmm. like, I mean, Aaron, I'll be honest with you. The fact that you want to interview me still blows my mind. Like, like, I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, so, um, I think when you sort of get your feet back on the ground again and sort of say, yeah, that's kind of what I want to do. Or, I, 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 I want to do this and it's going to be bumpy and it's going to be ugly and I'm going to do a lot of things wrong. Like I can name all the worst moments of my career, but I can't name mm -hmm. the best moments of my career because the best wow. moments are they, they, they're not traumatizing, right? Like I've worked on cool projects and I, I still, after all these years, I love what I do. Like I'm not jaded. I like, I'm, I'm happier than ever, but man, I can tell you those moments where I thought my career was over, like where I thought I've, I've effed up on something. And like, I could take you to the actual streets in Toronto where I walk along going, this is where I blew this job, or at least I thought, right? Wow. Because in your mind, yeah, everything, yeah, yeah. everything extrapolates, everything's magnified, right? Because it, it bounces around. Um, so those moments um, are the most impactful. Those, the, those moments of, of, of where you really believe you're, you're not going to be able to do this for, for whatever reason. And um, I, don't, I don't take those lightly. I, I carry those with me for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. um, I think for better because when I have moments of doubt, I remember I've had moments of doubt, you know, countless times over my career and I've managed to come out the other side. Mm -hmm. So I try to take a deep breath now and not, and not spiral as much as I can. <laughs> Dude, that's like, um, not to take comfort in your traumas, but that's reassuring to hear because... Of course. I've had similar moments as well. Like, and it, you're right exactly what you say. Like, the highs, be, it's, I'd say, like, it's impossible to really appreciate a high. Like, you can only appreciate it because it's reflected back at you from yeah. how others experience it. Like, it's, but the yeah, traumas exactly. and, the, and the low, yeah, and the, and the low points, they're the ones that really kind of stand out. Maybe it's like a biological thing. Like, it's a way to ensure survivability. Like, you, like, you know, let's say we're still still living in the cave that that time you got bitten by a snake when it makes you never got bitten by it again yeah. um you know you kind of remember those horrors those bumps those scrapes so maybe that's the mechanism behind it um but equally like you know you you, exp you explained it beautifully like i remember moments like you know where where landmarks or whatever where i'm thinking i remember how i was at that particular place at that point in time how i felt thinking that it was like kind of like the bottom or it's over and then yeah. i guess maybe it is the kind of point where it's like okay you, you are at the bottom but that's where you kind of push off from yeah. and also just to kind of like you know, my little anecdote out there as well like i had a similar kind of experience when i was in college so college over here is kind of like straight after high school for a couple of years and then it's university so i was like i think 17 at the time right and it was an art course but it's kind of like the first year was you do a bit of everything like textiles photography I discovered Photoshop there and then it was a bit of traditional 3D. So like, you know, sculpting, all that kind of stuff. Right. And I remember just like not turning up to the lesson that I actually enjoyed the most because I was just like, hey, uh, you know, I don't want to get up today kind of thing. And my lecturer at that time questioned me as well. said like, if you don't want to be here, you don't have to be here. Um, yeah. You know, like, am I doing something wrong? And I was like, no, 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 no. Like, it's not personal with you. But I remember that moment like it was yesterday. I remember yeah. exactly I was in the room and I was told and... Shout out to Rob McGuinness if you're listening. He was in my lecture at the time. <laughs> if he if he hadn't have said that conversation to me, I would not have, or maybe I would have, but at that point in time, I wouldn't have sorted my shit out. Yeah. And if it wasn't, and the second year, it was amazing. And 
to this day, he's like the best teacher I've ever had. Yeah. Um, but it's yeah, it's just weird. Like, it, exactly. And it was a kind of like, it's interesting how people and moments, you kind of need them as well. Like, it's not always just yourself kind of thing. It's like, you need these kind of like, maybe it's a moment, an event, or someone to kind of like kick up the backside to kind of keep you going. Um, so, yeah, just when you were mentioning all that kind of stuff, I was getting all these flashbacks of uh, my traumas. But um, I think, like you mentioned as well, as an artist, it's those traumas are like fuel, I guess you yeah. could say. I'll, I'll tell you, I, I prior to prior to doing this today, I listened to a bunch of your interviews. And, um, and what I noticed with some of them, a lot of people had different avenues. They went, oh, I initially studied to be this and, you know, it wasn't what I wanted. I always wanted to be an artist or I could have done this. Aaron, I cannot emphasize to you how this was, for me, it was all or nothing. Like, I, I, I was mm -hmm. not going to get into any other kind of program to do anything else. And so the unfortunate part about that is then that becomes this huge part of your persona, right? Like, you, you, like I am an artist, right? You get to say those mm -hmm. words, right? And, and, and to then watch it start to, or at least in your mind, start to go between your fingers like sand, right? Like this whole side of your personality that is valuable and could do some valuable things to so just watch it so quickly crumble. It's really traumatizing. Like it's, it's, it's it, like, I won't be able to call myself. What am I going to call myself? What, what, what am I going to, what's, what am I going to be worth? You know, I tell it, I'll, listen, I'll tell you this story and I've told it a few times when I was in junior high school here in, in, in Canada. So it was from like grade seven to grade nine. Again, I was, a really poor student. I was almost, I was, I was, I was so terrible. And this wasn't because I was belligerent or I was, you know, I didn't go to class. I'm just not particularly wired to be smart. And my history teacher noticed how bad I was. And he said to me, he, he sat me down and he said, um, what do you like to do, Dan? And I said, well, I like to draw stuff. I said, I like to draw. And he goes, well, tell you what, every assignment now in history for you is going to be a visual arts project. And, and I'm going to give you this whole side of the class to put up your work. And, and it didn't hit me till later, but all of a sudden I started to learn about history because I was taking in the words, but I was, I was regurgitating it in something that meant something to me, right? Like when you draw, you know, what? it's hard to explain to somebody who doesn't draw, but when you draw the, the stuff that's firing in your brain is pretty incredible, Right. Um, cause you're understanding everything about that image, or at least you're trying to understand everything about that mm -hmm. image, but it was the first time ever that I felt important or I felt valuable, right? Because I was always at the bottom of the class. I was always, you know, I was always scared to read out loud. I was always scared to put up my hand. Um, I was always scared to hand in my test, get my test results back. But suddenly this thing that I could do was really valuable in the, the, the teacher, my history teacher, we'd all face my drawings and we talk about the lesson in history. And, um, it suddenly that's when I started to realize that, okay, this isn't a parlor trick or this isn't just some sort of, um, you know, thing that you're good at, but that's valueless. It was, it was, it was really empowering. And it wasn't until I was older that I realized how empowering that was. Um, mm. you know, when you're, you know, 15, you're still an idiot, but you know, I just liked history because I got to draw more. Right. But, um, but getting back to what we're talking about, when you, when you start to doubt yourself or you, or you fail on a job, cause I failed on jobs. I've handed in terrible work. I've done millions of really, really average and poor job drawings. Right. Um, um, but, but that's, I think that's why it hurts so much because we put, mm. we, we, we've invested so much into, into ourselves, um, even with the self doubt, we still we still want to consider ourselves artists. That's why we enjoy these conversations because you get mm -hmm. it, I get it, right? Um, those moments of self doubt or failure are are, are pretty heart wrenching. They're 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 yeah, they really really hurt a lot. No, definitely. Um, first of all, shout out to your history teacher. That that's phenomenal that they would do that because, yeah. um, you know, I'm sure we've had teachers, um, a lot of listeners had teachers over they kind of just discourage you. And it's interesting because I think, at least in this day and age, um, art is more valued. Uh, artists are definitely valued, sometimes even stolen from. I'm sure yeah. we'll get to that later on. Yeah. Um, but um, obviously, and as a career as well, like it's clear that people can make 
a very solid living like some people i've spoken to definitely not myself yet um but um there's some people who have like um they've, they've compared their, their earnings to similar to like a doctor salary which sure. is considered a very good healthy salary um yeah. and you know people are paying houses mortgages all that kind of stuff so it's you know definitely something viable definitely something that is fruitful definitely yeah. as long as you put the effort in um yeah. but i'm sure like a lot of teachers would be like what are you doing focus on what's considered a steady solid career um yeah. but like you know it, it's also interesting that your teacher saw that and thought okay this is what they're passionate about let's lean into that even more and yeah. uh, like you mentioned that that's something that's definitely propelled you and definitely helped you to where you are today um but like with, with drawing itself have you always been like as soon as you picked up a pencil or a pen you're always mock making um as far as you're aware like were you always doing that yeah, my my dad, my dad was he was a really good artist, um, and so we I I always drew a lot. Like I have I have two siblings, a brother and a sister. My brother was musical. My sister was just passionate and maternal. She helps kids now, but she always like pets and animals. Nice. But my dad and I would draw a lot. Like I remember drawing on the beach with sticks, right? Um, and my dad owned um, a commercial art studio. Um, mm. Um, so I, I kind of was exposed to that. He wasn't an illustrator, but he could still draw, right? He, he ended mm -hmm. up being a really good, um, um, ended up managing a bunch of artists, right? Um, but I always like to draw because I think I'd like to, um, I'd like to, I'd li I like to imagine things that I could be. Like I didn't draw superheroes because I wanted to draw comics. I drew superheroes because I wanted to be one. Like, I, I just thought that was, I, li I like those ideas, right? So I was inspired by, um, you know, I remember when I was about 14 or 15, I really got into wildlife art, right? Um, so I taught myself and took up falconry. So I used to, I used to have hawks and falcons and I used to Sick. paint and draw them, right? So I always felt, I always felt that what we could draw were these worlds that we could go to, Right. Like I remember, I remember being in grade six and drawing motorcycles and just because I wanted, yeah. I wanted to, I was too young to have one, but I could, I could immerse myself in that world. So I was never emulating anything. I was just creating these worlds that I kind of wanted to, to be in. Um, and again, probably not unlike yourself because we're visual, like that's our language, right? So if we see mm -hmm. something we like, instead of talk about it, right, I want, I want to draw it. Right. And um, and and if you look through all my drawings and stuff as a kid, you can see all these different phases I went through. I remember drawing sharks. Right. You know, because you're, you know, sharks are fucking cool, man. So I'm going to draw sharks, <laughs> you know. Um, and uh, so I always use drawing as it, it would it would sound cliche to say an escape because I wasn't really escaping anything. But it was it was just the ability to sort of entertain yourself and in, in, in extrapolate a, a Across things that you thought were were really really interesting you know so so yeah i think that so i always did draw yeah for sure 100 percent. you know or did art you know i think that's a it's probably the best one of the best community i think anything that's considered creative it's like when you're trying to like tap into like you said like trying to build a world or escape into something it's yeah. it's probably the only way that you can do that um, what about like technique? Because you're an amazing artist, technically, I'd say phenomenal. Um, but like, was technique always something that you were concerned about? Um, or was that something that you kind of picked up later? Because for yeah. me, it was something that I kind of like had to realize that, okay, you know, let's say I was writing handwriting as an example. I was like, okay, my handwriting is very scruffy. I need to kind of like need to up a little bit. What was it like for you? Um, well, again, I, I remember... I remember I initially wanted to be an illustrator, like a proper illustrator. And that seemed to be just not how I was wired, right? I, I'm very impatient. Like when I draw, I'm up out of my seat constantly. Um, and and so like I was saying earlier, so storyboarding kind of suited me. But when I was trying to pursue a style, right? Because when you're younger, that's what you think you need to have, right? It's a style. I remember mm -hmm. I had this conversation years ago with a terrific illustrator, a guy named John Foster. And I think John's about my age. And we were saying like the first half of your career is you're chasing that style. And then the rest of your career is trying to get rid of it. Um, <laughs> True. Um, 
So, yeah, so what I finally decided to do, um, and this kind of happened later on when I started working digitally, it was easier to do. I started working with digital drawing tools because I still draw a lot, despite the fact everything's very 3D and whatever. Storyboarding is still very, you draw, you draw like crazy. Like you, it's still the fastest way to do things. I started creating mm -hmm. digital tools that were really cumbersome and awkward and they would force me to not worry about technique, but force me to worry about what I wanted to convey. Right. Mm. So I started like my, like I would say my storyboards are pretty, they're pretty chunky and blocky and kind of like frenetic. Right. Um, so I kind of, I kind of wanted to sort of focus on that rather than focus on refinement or, or detail that's not necessary. Or um, I wanted to break things down. I felt by giving myself tools that didn't allow me to be finicky or detail oriented, mm -hmm. um, a it would hide a lot of my my flaws, <laughs> but also also would really force me to 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 think about what's important about what I'm trying to convey, and um, and and that's kind of how I approach you know my drawing now. I guess I don't know if that made sense. And like, what's your you mentioned digital tools there? But like, do you have I'm going to ask a classic question, like what brushes do you use? But like, do you have like any specific kind of like traditional tools that you kind of go to, like certain specific pencils or... I remember when I was at uni, I did transport design. There were like certain pencils that I just favoured more than others. Um, yeah. And I, I almost felt that like if I didn't have that pencil, my drawing would be shit. Uh, the pencil made whatever I was making. Like, do you have certain uh, like go-to tools and stuff? Well, when I, when I first started, um, everything was traditional. There's no, there's no digital, right? So I, I did everything in, in pen and marker, right? Which was freaking, now that I think about it, like there's no net. You're working without a net. Magic, like markers on paper, like, I mean, I learned over time how to fix it and patch stuff over. But I mean, right. know, <laughs> when it goes down. But what I used to love to, so typically the way we would do a storyboard back then is you'd use like a, a water-based, a felt-based pen, like a Pentel or a Pilot or something like that, right? A Sharpie. And then you would go back with a benzene or a xylene-based marker. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't smudge the black line, right? So I used mm -hmm. to buy Pentels, and I'd pull all the caps off them and smash the end of the felt tip. And I would draw with them. I would dip them in water, and that would reactivate them, and they would be really brushy and loose. And then over the course of an hour, it would revitalize itself, and i have to put it aside and get another one, right? And um, because I always liked that, um, and I'm sure we'll get into this later, I always like, the thing I like about drawings is that they're drawings. Like, I like the fact that I can tell somebody else drew that. I like the fact, like, however, whatever endorphins it fires off in your head when you, you look at someone who's drawn something, whether it's digital or, or, or traditional, just that stuff that goes in your brain, like, wow, I wouldn't make that line or I love that thing or why do you do yeah, that yeah. Or, or whatever. So I always wanted my work to have, if I couldn't be accurate and have great anatomy, I'd like at least to have energy because for the most part, what I do is about energy. Like I'm trying to tell that story. I, I want, so I want my drawings to feel that way, right? I want my drawings to feel like if you, if you freeze a movie frame, it's mm -hmm. pretty weird looking, right? Like if you yes. just, just if you freeze it, like you go like, wow, that's weird. I kind of like that in my drawings. I kind of like them to feel a little bit cinematic. I, I, I want them to feel like a frozen frame, right? So I don't want everything to be in focus. I don't want everything to be detailed out. I want you to look at what I need you to look at. Um, I want it to feel like that's what the movie is going to look like. And that's kind of how I came up with, you know, how I, how I do stuff, you know, for better, or for worse. I'm sure there's countless yeah. people I don't know who don't like my stuff, <laughs> you know? Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know. I mean, that's like when it comes to storyboards, obviously their purpose is very self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. um, and like growing up, um, I really didn't understand story. We did it at school, like basic and normally just like, Hey, you know, um, just, copy a comic kind of thing like you know panels and all that kind of stuff and it was probably i really appreciated storyboarding in a filmmaking process and how important it is was 
when Lord of the Rings came out, well, the extended edition that told yeah. us how it was made. Yeah. And even to this day, like, you know, I'm still wowed and amazed by how heavily storyboards are leaned upon for the final shot. Um, and I'm sure we'll get to, the, get to that in a little bit as well. But like, and you've kind of explained it a little bit as well earlier on, but like you've done storyboarding for a vast array of mediums, yep. not just particularly film. Yep. Um, which one do you prefer? Out of, the, out of them all because you've done games you've done advertising you've done films tv i'm sure there's a few others that i haven't mentioned yeah like I, I would like to say that i'm kind of i've kind of done with advertising um i would say that i worked in in the like a really good period of advertising when there wasn't it wasn't competing with the internet and all different streams of media mm. and whatever so you know in, in my days i worked with you know uh commercial production companies owned by Ridley Scott or, uh, you know, you know what I mean? Like they all, they were in it and budgets were really big because broadcast was the place to put your commercials. Right. Yeah. So over time, advertising got more, um, um, sort of, you know, I'm not, I don't want to rag on the ad industry. I, I did well in it and I know a lot of people in it, but it became so overly thought out with focus groups and marketing specialists and people from universities that you um, you rarely did anything interesting anymore because people are offended by advertising, right? There's, there's all kinds of conditions that you have to go through. And like I said earlier, it's about influence. It's not about information. It's not about story, mm -hmm. right? There's these, there's these underlying, and again, I'm not trying to make it sound like it's, you know, it's evil or anything, but, but, you know, for whatever that 15 or 30 seconds, you know, they need to convey what they think they need to convey. Right. Um, so it gets pretty abstract. So I think now what I really like to work on, I like to work on smaller films and, um, I like, I, I'm really fortunate where I, I do a lot of work with, um, blur on love, death and robots. There's nothing like working on short, short format stuff. It's the best. It's because the story, you can hold it in your hand, right? Yeah. And you can stand at the beginning of the story and you can see the end of it. And every decision you make is important, right? Like on, on some films, you got to pad stuff, right? There's a, there's a certain amount of minutes that need to be based on the contract. Like they got, the studio's got to deliver this many minutes and, or this isn't working. So we're going to have to wedge something in, but in a short, it's pure. Right. Like that's why people love them. That's why that's why because they're just and I think everything you draw, everything you do, every decision you make is really, really impactful. Right. It's like it's like having that one bite of food rather than a whole meal. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, so I like that. I like games a lot. Um, I, I, I like working on cinematics. Um, I, I find it's at a little more relaxed pace. Um, I find games because there's a big development curve. They have lots of assets for you. They've given it a lot mm. of thought. Um, um, and, and, um, and then but generally speaking, I think for the most part, unless, unless you're working on a really big picture, it's, it's super intimate, right? Like I'm just working with the director, even on a big, like I just finished a little while back working on the latest Planet of the Apes movie. And it's, it's you know, it'll be big and it'll be effective and it'll be great, but my job is just me and the director. Like I don't, I don't interface with the art department. I don't interface with like, we just sit down and we go, this would be cool. Or, Oh okay, no, he would never do that. Or why don't we try yeah. this? And what's so great about storyboarding is you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Virtual dollars. Um, yeah. if you get to do anything, that's why storyboarding is so important. Like you can go, you can, shoot for the moon. And then, you know, the producers walk in and go, you're crazy. We can't afford that. <laughs> and, um, but you get to, you get to try all this stuff, right? You get to, you get to, you get to try all this really neat stuff just between you and the other person who's passionate about the story, you hope. And, um, and, 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 and that's what, what I like. I find if you get on something really big, sometimes you're, you're dropped in, in the second act or the third act, and you're trying to understand who the characters are. And it's, I, I just like when you can hold the whole story in your hand. Powerful. Um, yeah. I guess like, and you kind of explained it a little bit earlier as well. It's like the, it seems when you're storyboarding, storyboarding with the director as well, that's like, I guess the most purest way to mm -hmm. make that particular story. Like it's yeah. not something that you kind of get 
further down the line when it's kind of half fleshed down, you kind of like got to patch things up sometimes. Um, yeah. It's completely, I guess you could say blue sky. I'm sure there's scripts involved as well. Um, yeah, but 100%. like, is there, I guess I got a million questions to ask, but one that's just jumped to me right now. Like, is there any particular, and I guess like, how do you see, I hope this question makes sense, but like, how do you see yourself or how do you see a storyboard when you make it? Or do you see it as an entire thing or like from scene to scene or like from panel to panel or frame to frame? Um, like, how do you see that? Like, for example, um, been doing a bunch of concept sketches for, for or whatever, like, you know, I tend to see like as each idea distinct from the other one um, as opposed to like the whole collection, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, how do you kind of see a storyboard if that makes sense yeah that's a great question um first of all every job's a bit different because every director has a different process um 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 like i have some directors that uh, are very buttoned down like you get an amazing shot list and um you just kind of it's pretty route you just kind of you kind of add what you can right you try to bring them to life um um but the way i kind of the, the way i work is i look at a scene as a gesture Right. Just like we do gesture drawings. Right. So I try to break the scene down as quickly as I can in, you know, whatever. And, you know, now like I'm working on something right now and I, I, I think it's right now it's about 170 or 175 drawings, but really fast. I break it all down. And then because you need to look at that whole gesture, you need to see, is that reading? Does that flow? Right. And then you can come back and you can you can start to edit like you would edit your gesture, right? So you add details. You, I might go, I need some insert shots here, or I didn't explain this well, or or that's not working. So I, I look at it like one big picture, and 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 I treat it that way. I go from a gesture to to sort of fixing the things that that need fixing the anatomy to carry the analogy along, uh, fix the anatomy of this scene, um, and then add some detail. Right. Where I can like, I think we need this and it would be nice if we did that. Um, and then it's not uncommon if it, and, and that kind of comes as your career moves along. Then I pitch ideas or alternate ideas or or whatever. Like I try to break like storyboard artists. I mean, we're weird people to begin with. But one of our big jokes is we get these screenplays and it'll go <laughs> it'll go, you know, character A meets character B and then a fight ensues. Like that's, like, <laughs> yeah. that's what you get. Right. So I start to break down like how I, if, if, if there's action and it can be even very subtle action. Like I, I might go, I, I don't, I, I, I think we could do this a better way. I think this will, the, the audience will be more empathetic or the audience will be more frightened if we do this, or it might set up this next thing, but you need to get that. You need to get that gesture down. You need to get those beats down, right? You need to, you mm. need to make sure you're still telling that story. It's like when I was um, when I was in art college. I think we all had that one person um, in our class who really liked to draw horses, and they would always draw the eye really, really detailed, and <laughs> not like draw the rest of the head. They would sit there all class. You you can't do that in a storyboard. You can't you can't sit there and work on this, a single frame. I tell here's another anecdote. I tell people when when I was at art college, I had a I had a, a, an instructor who had an art studio in Toronto and every few years he would, um, he would take a student out of the class as an apprentice, right. And, and go in, it was, it was a great studio. So what he said, he goes, every year I picked four students that I felt had the most promise. I bring each one in for a day and give them a storyboard. And he goes, I never picked the kid who do, did the best storyboard. He goes, I always picked the kid who finished. Right. Mm. And I went, and it really struck me, right? Yeah, like you need to you need to finish this off. Like I need to, and I think as storyboard artists, you start to realize that it is not about making pretty pictures. It is about information. It is about trying to enhance that story. It is about like storyboards inform everybody from you know the story to to production to the lawyers to the money to the it's. It's that dumb piece of paper you get when you open an IKEA box. That's exactly what they are. <laughs> right? And um, and so you need to you need to you need to make sure that you you're getting that that particular scene down, right? And um, 
And often what I do is I, I then show that gesture to the director. And now we're both looking at something. So, mm. so most times now what I do is I, I sit and I talk about a scene with the director and then I'll go, let me go away. And they go, let me put down what I think we talked about. Cause we can both nod. Yes. But you know, we're, we're not seeing. And I, and I gesture that board out and then I put it in front and now we have things to talk about. He goes, yeah, okay. I think things are falling apart here or I saw this a bit different here. And, 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 and that's how you work it. But um, yeah, get all the, get all the pictures down as fast as you can. And then try to make them look better later if you can. <laughs> Sick. I, I like the way you kind of explain that. It's almost like, I guess, like a composition, so to speak. Like, it's not just about individual moments or instruments or the catchy loop, so to speak. It's about the entire piece and how it flows and all mm -hmm. these different things here and there as well. Um, like how difficult is it? Because you just mentioned there, like, how bleak the words can be from the script to the page. And that's something that I think I would struggle a ton with, where there's like limited information. Yeah. It's great when it's kind of open to interpretation, but I always fear that maybe I can get lost in that and then it's not productive. Um, so like, I guess like, um, how do you find translating it from a script? Like, is it has it always been a challenge or is that something you enjoy? Like trying to get that, you know, character A means character B and then, you know, they fall over or something and then interpret the interpretation is that where the fun is at for you um or is it the complete opposite yeah no i um um it's 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 like i was telling you earlier like i've been doing this a long time but i still love it like i still that's my wife i still love sitting down and what i like about it and i'll, I'll answer a question before you ask it i don't have any personal projects that i want to do like i like not knowing what i'm about to get like i'm working on a movie right now I would have never in a hundred years told you that's what this movie would be about. Right. So suddenly I have to learn a whole bunch of stuff about something I didn't know anything about. And I'm working with a director who's, um, you know, in this, in this particular case, he's a first time director, but he's a seasoned showrunner. So, and I'm learning how to, um, I'm learning how to uh, understand him. And I like to, I like to, I read the script I make notes and then I like to walk. I, I think better when I walk. So I'll mm. go, I'll go for a walk and I just start to imagine myself like storyboard artists will tell you that we kind of get to be everything. We get to be the actors. We get to be costume guys. We get to be the directors. We get to be the, the DOP. And I just start to feel how I, I, I feel like how this scene would be, how these two people would interact. Right. Mm -hmm. And when we have our sketchbooks and we often preach to people go out and take your sketchbook out right and fill up that that sort of gray matter with images i also look at how people interact like i also i also look at how you know somebody who's walking into a dental office for the first time like you know with, you know they they kind of stay back they they may not go right up to the person right somebody's pissed off cuz they didn't get their hamburger ordered right they walk right up and they they want to get in that guy's face. So I start to read the script and imagine how the characters would be. And then based on my discussion with directors, how do I want to, how do I want to frame that? Like, how do I want to, where do I want the cameras to be? Do I want it where, um, you know, we can get caught up in, especially these days, you can put the camera anywhere. Right. But there's yeah. times where you go, no, I, I don't want, I don't want the viewer to notice the camera at all. Right. Or there's times where I want the camera to be the, the third party in this. Right. Um, or I want the set to 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 play a part in this like or I even suggest um, sound design like I, I even I even suggest, you know, I, I think I think we need to hear this or I don't even think we need to see the character in this. They can their all their dialogue can be off screen. Right. So you just start to think about you just start to in your head, you walk yourself through that 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 scene, you, you walk yourself through what you think is is going to happen and um and, and and i like i even like dialogue scenes i think dialogue scenes are super important and really like we often get dumped in on the 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 big money stuff because that's where they got to plan it out right what's in <laughs> camera what, you know what's in post what's 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 a what's an effect what's a v effect um but i like when you get to do that that scene that's emotional and it's between, you know, two or three people or, or a one person. And, and, you know, how, how do I want to frame that? You know? So, mm. um, um, yeah, I think, I think you just, you just sort of think in terms of, of how you, you, you would see that story. 
you know, and, and over time you kind of have a better arsenal in your head of, um, of, of how you might tell that story. And then of course you're working with a terrific director, right. You know, who's gonna, who's gonna help you through it. And, and like I said, sometimes I have no say in stuff. Like there's times where I can point on screen and go, that shit's mine. Like I, I yeah, came up, yeah, not yeah. only did I come up with those shots, I came up with that idea. And then there's other movies where I drew frame for frame what the director wanted. Right. So, so we're not. That's, always, that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, not, and like, <laughs> uh, you kind of answer one of my questions there, like in terms of, I guess like references and it's cool to hear that one of the references is not almost visual. It's almost like those subtleties, like how people behave, like behaviors, like interactions and things like that. And, Obviously, that's something that's always uh, perhaps exaggerated and heightened when you see things on film, because you know, like, um, not often, but we take take our kids to like the theatre, and obviously, there's normally stuff for like a kid's age, and the way they act on stage is very exaggerated, almost yes. like you know, like a like a, a kids play. Well, it is a kids yeah. play, so it's like very exaggerated. Yep. So on TV is kind of toned back, but even on TV is still heightened compared to like um, normal interaction. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, like that, that's that, that's fascinating. And would you say that's something that you lean into the most? Because I'm sure there's a big, big ton of like visual stuff that you rely on, like in terms of, I guess, facial structures and different types of faces and emotions and how they look on faces, or or no, maybe. Yeah, I think it becomes. Um, I think it becomes how how big are the movements do you want to make based on the source material, right? So you can have a scene where it's huge, right? Where there's things exploding and cars are rolling off stuff or, mm -hmm. you know, apes are chasing other apes on horseback. And then you can have a scene where just the, the person's gaze goes from center to left and that's super impactful, right? Like it's, 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 it's understanding what's important in that scene and what, where you can emphasize the most out of that, right? Um, I worked on something recently where I had, a, I went off script and I had a character throw his cigarette down and it became the whole scene. It, it, some, I mean, I can't tell you about it, but it, the director went, Oh my God, like I, I'm going to end on that shot. Sick. And because I felt as though the, the, obviously the character in this had a cigarette and he's smoking. And I felt it was this subtle move. We all seen guys throw a cigarette down. Um, but I felt it kind of punctuated, there was a finality to it. Um, it described the character a little bit more, right? He was a little bit glib. He was a little bit offhand. Um, the conversation that just went, uh, between the two characters, this, this discarding something that was still alive because it, it goes mm. into the water. Um, I think again, small, but move the scene quite a bit. And I think it would move the, hopefully move the viewer quite a bit. Right. So, but Aaron, that you figure that out after you get past that first part we were talking about, after I draw it all out. Yeah, yeah. Right. And then I go, God, you know, it'd be great if you did this. I think I'll pitch that. I'll pitch that idea and see, and see what they think. Right. And there are times where it's total crickets, dude. Like <laughs> I, I have pitched, I recently pitched an idea. I could barely sit still through the meeting because I was, got, I had this idea that was amazing, and I, it was, you could have heard a pin drop after I said it. Oh man! And then I just kind of went. <laughs> <laughs> so um, wow. yeah, you get your ass kicked. You get your ass kicked a lot because you do. You you play theater of your mind, right? You build it yeah. up in your mind. You start to see how how it would be on camera, and how it fits with the story, and you think it's really genius. You forget that there's a director, there's a producer, there's other people, and they're just not going to see it the way you saw it, right? So. You love you love your babies for a little while, but you know they're going to take them from you sometimes, right? That's true. Yeah. Um. One thing you mentioned there was about like giving your own suggestions yeah. to the project and to the piece as well. And I remember like first starting out, I was definitely very timid. I was like, "This yes, is the task. 100%. I'll do this. Yes, yep. sir. We'll do that." And then slowly over time, it's kind of like, "No, I want to suggest this, not out of stubbornness, just thinking yeah, let's try this instead." Um. Yep. Just because. Like you said, like you might have a good idea. It yep. might not be good. Let's try it out kind of thing. And that's very valuable. Um, yeah. Is that something that you've always done? Or is that something no. that you kind of learn slowly over time? No, in the beginning, I was super subservient. Um, you, you still to this day, you have to shake off that. I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this kind of thing, right? 
Um, and one false step could mean the end of your career and everything you've built on top of that. So that's, that's, that's very, very difficult. Um, also, you know, your age, right. You know, when you're younger, you're sitting, you're sitting with, you know, a bunch of people who are older and they've made a lot of stuff and you just don't feel like it's, it's your sort of area. And then the third part of that is, you know, what's your relationship like with the director, right? So um, I'm really, God, you know, I've heard so many interviews and stuff. I feel really fortunate. I couldn't even count on one hand the bad times I've had on projects. Um, like all the directors that I work with or, you know, some are become your friends, right? Um, but I just think, I just think that um, I, I've always been about trying to make a relationship is really important to me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm probably maybe to a fault, a bit of a people pleaser. Um, I don't get, I don't, I don't, I can be crushed. I would never let you know that I'm crushed and I would try to do better. I mean, I'm good for sticking up myself, but the line is pretty far, right? Like I can take, uh, some, yeah, I, get you. I can take some abuse because I've been in it a long time and I know a lot of the abuse, abuse, I'm using that term, like a lot of difficulties Everybody's got a lot of stuff on their shoulders, right? And and sometimes it just comes out that way. But uh, I'm pretty good at reading the room now, so I can tell when mm -hmm. I can kind of interject some ideas and when I just feel like it's not going to be worth it at this point. I think you know, and I'm not saying the project is bad, but I just think it's it's kind of on the rails, and you know, we're trying to get to the finish line because you know, in inevitably money and time run out, you know, and mm -hmm. you, you don't want to pitch stuff, but. But I think it's important that that you start to um, feel your value and how you implement your value to a project. Um, I think it, I think it bolsters your career, um, particularly in this day and age now, where everything is 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 kind of changing. I think having those intangibles are going to help you. Right? You want to be somebody who people want to um, collaborate with. You know, people. You know, you want to bring other value than just like drawing stuff like storyboards, you know, I mean, that's the line, you know, storyboards aren't about drawing. Right. But if you can draw, it helps. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, um, I guess I'm maybe explaining this wrong, but it's kind of the, the but it is just a visual translation of the script. And I guess the keyword mm -hmm. there is the translation because it's, um, and translation implies to communication. And I guess yeah. that's what it's always about. I'm sure. Um, and so like, um, just to kind of like make sure I've got all my, facts right is is this kind of storyboard always done before the product's even greenlit or does it need to be greenlit first or is it a mixture it's a mixture it's it's uh -huh. a mixture um I, I i mean the very one of the very first big pictures i worked on was um uh, uh 300 with zach snyder and i was boarding stuff up and i was talking to the producer and i said oh so and that was a difficult project if i remember to get going because um now that you've seen the film, Zach had a very different idea of how that, mm -hmm. like he wanted to pay homage, not to the story of 300, but to Frank Miller's graphic novel telling of 300. And I think at the time Troy had come out and it, it bombed, right? It was just sucked. It was another sandal epic and the <laughs> studios were, were really hesitant to put money into it because they thought, Oh, this is going to be the same thing. Yeah. And anyway, so we, we did, so I, I storyboarded some stuff up and Zach did a test run on it, right. To show him how this was going to look. And I remember talking to the producer and saying like, oh, so we, we, we got the green light. He goes, oh no, it's not green lit. But he goes, if I don't start making it now, he says, we'll not hit the, the perceived target. So, so wow. it's, it's not uncommon to start boarding stuff early. Um, we board pitch stuff all the time. Um, you know, like I work on a lot of stuff that never sees the light of day. Uh -huh. You know, you, 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 they want to go in with some concept work with a sizzle reel, maybe, and then let's board out a sequence or something like that. So that, that, that's always really fun because there's hardly anyone involved. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, you, you're just kind of boarding something up and it's, you know, it's good enough. It goes in the deck and off it goes. That's, that's interesting because I'm just going to like, I literally ask, like, do you mind that some of that stuff is never seen? Um, I've, I've gotten used to it. Um, yeah, like I always want everyone to be successful. I know how hard it is to get stuff made. Um, it, like even the best of the best, like I've, I've worked with, you know, directors where you go, oh, for sure, this is going to happen. 
and it doesn't, right? For whatever reasons, like you can get all the way up the line in a production and then somebody moves like that executive producer goes right. to another studio and the whole house of cards falls down again. Right. Um, and that's only from my perspective, like, you know, imagine mm-hmm. if you're, you know, the, the people above me. So, um, so yeah, I'm kind of, um, yeah, things it's, it's really weird. Like, like I'll work on something and then five years later I hear it's in production, you know? Um, or you just, you look through your, your folders of work and you go, what the hell ever happened to that? You know? Yeah. Um, so like often what happens is, um, studios will option scripts or option, um, um, you know, novels or graphic novels and whatever the constraints are on that option, like it's two years, is it three years to develop it? And then once that ends, do they re, uh, do they renew that or they just let it go? Like, I remember I worked on not a particularly great version of, um, Stephen King's, uh, um, What's the what's it called the the one with the gunslinger Idris Elba Dark Tower it? yeah Dark Tower that apparently that that had been optioned by everybody apparently that thing had hands all over it um, people had it for a couple of years then let it go and then it went it went it went yeah. and finally finally got made um, but but I'm sure there's all kinds of concept art and stuff from other production <laughs> companies around for that one because I, I felt like everybody touched that. <laughs> Oh, I can imagine. When I had heard that that was being made, I was like eagerly, I haven't seen the Doctor film, the one that actually came out, um, yeah. but I've read the books and I love them. Like, and it's always like, if someone makes that, it's like, that is does feel like, I know they've said like Lord of the Rings was considered impossible to make. Obviously they made it, yeah. um, but this does feel like the impossible one because it could be anything. It could be a TV show. It could be a movie. It could be a game. It could be all of those things. And it's just a lot happens in there. Yeah. Um, and I just the I fact read, that you mentioned that kind of like, yeah, I think you read where they're pitching a series for it because the, the, again, the, the feature film format is not good for something that's that broad. Yeah. You know, um, I watched it. It was okay. Uh, you know, I don't think it was great. I think probably the fans were probably pretty let down by it. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, you're trying to, that's what I'm talking about. A 15 minute story. That's why I like working on shorts. Cause you can get everything in as opposed to a collection of books. And you're trying to compress it into a movie and you're trying to, you're trying people in that theater may not have even read the books. Right. Mm-hmm. So you're trying to, you know, you're, you're doing all these things. Uh, you're really strong arming things to make people understand things that would be very nuanced, you know, across maybe a mm-hmm. couple of volumes. Right. So um, adaptations are just tough, you know, and you mentioned there like shorts. Um, I mean, Love Death Robots has been a phenomenon. Yep. And I think for a lot of people in the creative industry, for sure, like it's just, you could say a breath of fresh air, like just in terms of products that they're making and yep. the artists that it empowers as well. It's almost like it's the most, it's a very artist friendly production. Um, yep. Do you see or have you seen that like more of a trend? Like there's going to be more short film? stuff um happening like is that kind of stuff you're getting more and more I, I, I'm, of I'm more coming on, inbox i'm working on something similar right now another project that's very similar to that um um it seems to have it seems to have uh an audience people like it um one of the issues i think they have is because it's not serial based is getting people all the way to the end of it because there's mm-hmm. not the motivation to oh there's no cliffhangers about it right so each story as a beginning and end, um, like for you and I, we watch all of them, right? And we watch them all again because they're so freaking amazing, yep, right? Yep. The stories are great. The art's great. Um, so how do you package that to make sure that you get that sort of higher completion rate that, say, a Netflix or an Amazon looks for, right? They want completion rates on their stuff. Um, you know, how do you get, like, they could be, somebody could be excited for three episodes and then the next day they forget about it, right? Because there's no, there's, no, there's no lingering question in yeah. your head right um i like them because they're just super cool and bite size and um and um they're like twilight zone episodes right like you just go like like i always find there's nothing more disappointing than when a movie has an amazing concept but it's not strong enough to to hold the whole movie together where you just go like dude that's such a cool concept right that's what that's so great about shorts right because they can just be this 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 one pager right but I think what's cool about yeah. what, what Love, Death, and Robots they do is they actually get somebody to write the story 
and that story is handed off in, if some a lot of the stories come from um, actual authors, but they hire authors to write it, then they hire screenwriters to adapt them, then they go to the to the production studio. So they're that they're really authentic. They're really authentic. That's why they feel so good. You know, they feel so they feel so complete. Ah, so I always thought like because I know you got Blair Studio doing them and a few like, access to a few as well. Yeah, I thought it was their pitches, so the stories get get shipped out to these studios. Yeah, I think I think um, in the beginning, and 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 I may be mistaken here. I think that what ended up working better for Volume Two and Volume Three is that if they got all the content lined up first, um, because you can imagine the the legal um, hoops you have to jump through with this many studios, this many authors, this many stuff. So I think getting everything kind of lined up, and then mm. and then working with the, with the studios, I think is a better um, sort of formula for the money guys and the lawyer guys and everything that goes on there. Um, it it's so easy sense. to like over, overlook that. Like, you know, like you mentioned earlier on, like, you know, we're just like drawing and making this thing. And then there's all these other stuff happening in the background that can really, oh. like you mentioned, like derail it and stuff. And it, it's also interesting as well, because I know like shows, even reality shows versus live TV versus scripted television, sitcoms and all the other different genres you have to movies to short form, they all like have different mechanisms that require it to work. And, and um, like you mentioned, there, like the strategy behind making Love, Death, Robots, I'm sure similar things as well, is a little yeah. bit different to how films are going to work. And it's, it's, I guess, is that useful for you to kind of know like how these things are produced? And does that in turn influence how you tackle any briefs you get given? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, because of my situation, like I'm a, I'm a freelancer, right? I work out of my house now, um, here in Toronto, so I'm not in a big studio environment, um, mm -hmm. so I can't, I, I, I can't pretend that I know a whole lot about, you know, everything, everything I know is anecdotal, sure, yeah. right? It, is, is, is told to me, um, but yeah, I, I, any storyboard artist will tell you that we have a, we have a broad understanding of, of production and what things cost and what, how you can, um, coming up with great ideas and coming up with fantastic ideas is really appreciated. Coming up with money saving and time saving ideas is really appreciated, right? Mm -hmm. on, on the other, on the other side of it, if you can, if you can do a scene with half the setups and, you know, they freaking love you, right? If, if you come up with a, like a great way to communicate the same thing, um, that's going to be, you know, way less time and, and way less money than, you know, but we tried to do that. So I try not to kitchen sink everything. Like I try not to, I try to, to really sort of understand that, you know, producers are good people too. And, you know, they, they got reasons they worry about money and, that, and, sure, um, yeah. and, and if a producer likes you, they, they drag you around from productions, right? Like producers seem like they work more than directors, right? Um, mm -hmm. so if you can, if you can, you got, got to take in mind their job as well. Right. Like I, I, I like producers. They're, they're, they're super nice. And if you treat them respectfully, um, you get their respect, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, yeah, you know, the, you can have fun with them. I was, I worked on a show once with two directors and we would do these zoom calls and we'd be working out a scene whenever the director would walk in we just go on this outlandish, so totally made up scene just to see if we could stop him in his tracks, you know? Right, right. Like, go, okay, then the herd of elephants come running in, but they're on fire. And, and he go, he go, what? What the fuck? What? What? You know? No, no. <laughs> we don't have money for that. <laughs> um, so, um, like, and that, that's, that's another thing as well. Like with, with directors, for example, um, I, I'm just fascinated a huge fan of like just movies and shows and just anything entertainment related games for example um and just how the stuff goes from like you know beginning middle and then how it's built and made and then obviously how it's received yeah. and even yeah. i get like you know bummed out when something that i think is great and you kind of know a lot of cool i'd say like pure creativity from what i can see has gone into it and it's not well received i kind of like get a bit sad about it um but yeah. like how important is it for you to kind of like build a relationship with directors and all the stakeholders that you're working with? Like, is that something that you um, work on or is that just something that you kind of like just let it um, flow naturally? Um, I, I like to be liked. 
don't know if that's a good thing or, or not. Um, I like to be um, a problem solver um, to the best of my ability. I, I learned uh, early on in my career that how to like things can get tense once in a while. Not so much anymore. I don't know why, but especially in my early days in advertising, because advertising, everything's compressed. Mm -hmm. And you can get like somebody call you up. It's, it's the end of the day. And they said, Holy shit, we just lost the location or we need these boards for the morning. And you know, and you're like, Oh, what the fuck? How am I supposed to do that? Right. And the problem with that is you're not solving their problem, right? You throw a tantrum, the sun comes up the next day and you look like an idiot, right? Cause all your fury has gone and everything like that. And you still got to get this thing fixed. Right. So I've learned over time that to be calm and to try and fix things, uh, I'm the first person to admit when I've screwed up, right? Because then you don't have that, you don't have that back and forth. You just go, oh man, dude, I, I, I totally forgot I was supposed to do that scene first. My fault. Good. Conversation's over. Go fix that, right? Um, the less, uh, I always look at it this way. Everybody's got a million things going on. If I can take one of the things off their plate, Right, so if producer have, doesn't have to worry about storyboards, my job's done. Director doesn't have to worry about storyboards, my job's done because they got to worry about a thousand other things. And mm -hmm. you see how stressed they get out as they get into production; it's brutal. So, um, yeah, like I said, I, I like to I like to develop really good relationships because I think that also I enjoy it more, right? Mm -hmm. um, and also, it offers you avenues to to be creative, right? They trust you more. Um, because you, you kind of respect their time and, and, and what they're trying to do. Um, like who doesn't want to work with people you like, right? That's true. And, and I, and, but I'll, but I'll say this, I, I'm also not a big proponent of being a doormat either, right? Like I have, I have a line, um, where I have gone, I've, again, this is going way back, but where I've gone, I'm clearly not the right guy for this job. Like I don't throw a tantrum, but I go, I just don't feel like. I'm going to give mm -hmm. you what you need or whatever. Um, and that's appreciated, especially if you do it early on. Like I remember in the beginning, you probably experienced this when you first started, you, you take every job that gets offered to you because you just you can't believe somebody's contacting you over time. You realize you're not cut out for every job. Right. Yep. And I would say to people, I would go, you know what? Like if somebody calls me up to work on something that's highly animated, even though I work on animated stuff, I still consider myself a live action guy. But mm -hmm. if somebody, if somebody called me up to work on something that was very Pixar or, or oriented, I would just say, I, I'm not your guy. I, I would love mm -hmm. to help. But in the number of times they thank you, they just, the producer goes, thanks for being honest with us. Like, mm -hmm. cause you know, cause I could struggle for three weeks and do nothing that's valuable to them. They can't get the three weeks back. They can't. Um, and so sometimes, sometimes you, you make points by just saying, yeah, I'm, that's, that's not my jam. Uh, I'm, I'm not your guy. I mean, you're always a little perplexed. They called you anyhow. Yeah. Um, you know, somebody called me up for like a talking animal movie and I'm like, no, <laughs> it's like, it's, you know, I can't do talking animals. So that's, you know, so, um, yeah, it's just being honest with yourself, um, um, and trying to establish a good relationship right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, cause most people are, most people are really good people and, um, who doesn't like making movies or games, you know? Very true. And yeah. not to put you on the spot, um, yeah. obviously we can edit, edit this out if it does, who has been the best person or director, I guess you've worked for or with, or like maybe a top for you perhaps if there's not one. It's, it's a tough one. Um, I would say, um, like I would say, you know, more recently, I love working with Tim Miller at Blur. Um, I find, and, and he's going to punch me in the face because uh, I can get gushy about Tim. Because Tim's a, Tim can come off like a kind of a no-nonsense kind of bristly guy. But he's got a big heart. He's super generous, super passionate, um, just loves making stuff, gives you credit even when you don't deserve it. Um, and, uh, and, and he's just a real guy. He's just, you don't, mm. you don't, you don't, you don't feel like, you know, he'll just, he'll just call you up to talk. Um, and he's always got something cool going on. So he's, he's kind of my, he's kind of my favorite. I did, I worked with a, another director, a lot, a guy named Craig Gillespie. We did Corella together. Okay. Um, cool. We did I, Tanya together, um, which is a great movie. 
Um, so very different. Uh, you know, Craig has a very dry sense of humor. I've learned a lot from Craig. Um, he's just a solid director um, and he can take any genre. Um, I really like working with Craig a lot. We can get a lot done in a short period of time. Um, you know, so, um, yeah, yeah. Like I said, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty malleable, <laughs> you know, oh, I still what's have... the, um, so no, uh, what's the, what's the best kind of project you like working on? Um, I'd like when they're, um, that's a great question. Uh, I like when it's a new IP. I like when it's new and it's exploratory. Um, and it's again, and it, and it, and you're dealing with, with some, something that's smaller. Like if you get brought in mm -hmm. on something that's a franchise, um, you, you, it's a big machine that's cranking away, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's something nice that when, you know, Hey, we're sending you the revised script again, you know, and you know, it's kind of in this gestation period and, and you're kind of, and you're kind of working through stuff. It's great. This, this feature I'm working on now, the director wrote it. So it's very personal to him. So I've learned a lot about him through this script. Um, it's really, really, it's really interesting. I've never really worked on a project where it, it's from the, from that person. Like it's part of their fabric. You know, most of the wow. time you're, you know, you work on something that's fantastic or super violent or something. But um, um, I like intimacy. Like I like this, Aaron. I like, I like, you know, like when you, when you asked me to do this, I didn't agree because I felt like I had a lot to contribute based on all the freaking superstars that you've interviewed, but I like talking to you. <laughs> right. Like, like, cause we're Same, man. Yeah. This yeah. is, this is the best thing about it. It's just like, it's just a recorded conversation that yeah. could easily have happened without yeah. a camera yeah. and internet connection, which is, I guess a great thing because if this technology never existed, we would never speak. No, unless we cross paths somewhere and, even nowadays, which which does kind of like bum me out a little bit, it's like it's very difficult to have like these blocks of time with just even people you do have direct access to nowadays because everyone's just moving fast and busy and all sorts. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So now this is this is the best, especially yeah. when it's like creatives. There's just something it just never gets boring speaking about creativity to creatives. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm sure you, you feel the same. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, we we live in this world in our head, right? And um, I remember when, back in the old conceptart.org days, um, when they used to do the workshops, right? The massive mm -hmm. black guys. Um, they asked me to, to, to come to them. And, uh, you know, I said no initially because, you know, that's kind of who I am. And um, I remember them saying, no, no, you got to come. Because he goes, there's going to be a day where, I don't know if you know Android Jones, but Android said to me, he goes, there's going to be a day where nobody gives a shit about you, man. He goes, you got to come now, right? <laughs> and what I, felt was, what I felt was the best part of finally getting together with people, because you got to remember, that was at the beginning of forums and whatever, mm -hmm. is how we all kind of shared that same kind of like, like, do you think you're not as good as you think you are? And go, yeah. And like, everybody's going like, yeah, like, I can't draw in front of people. Like, you know, like, you know, some people yeah, can. Yeah. Not everybody could, Right. And, and you just feel this, this sort of, um, this sort of friendship and this, this sort of the, everybody understands, you know, like I can say two words to you and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Right. Like you, like where the regular people in your orbit don't, you know? Yeah. Um, and, 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 and I think we, we sort of live in a unique environment. At least I like to believe, you know, I don't think we're any better than anybody, but, it, but I think, I think what we do for a living um, is really, really interesting because it's a really big part of what we do. You know, it's it's, it's a really big part of who we are. And um, that is absolutely true. Yeah. yeah. It's like the identity is like speaking of speaking to people like yourself as well and how much it's a part of you. Like, like I've had to do jobs just to pay the bills that were never creative. Yeah. I remember every day on that job thinking, I can't wait or will it ever happen where I can just earn a living from being creative, yeah. for example. And if there's something about like, you just have to, like there's no other option. And yeah. it's like, that's your being and it will never like this. Even if it's like only for one day yeah. out of the rest of your life that you can say you've done it, that's all it takes. That's all you're happy with, right? Um, yeah. And there's something powerful about doing something that you want to do not in a selfish way not in a like an egotistical way 
it's just what's the point if you can't do what you want to do kind of thing yeah and yeah. E- even though I, like like yourself i've got a lot of friends who have those like you could say normal jobs which are like you know very well carved out career paths and everything yeah um so they've, they have and they've told me they've looked at me thinking what are you doing you should just forget it stick go for something that's more proven yeah. but then to yourself you're just thinking no you have to find a way and when you do it's kind of like hey it's the greatest thing ever um yeah i but, don't, I, yeah, don't ever take it, yeah. I don't ever take it for granted ever ever yeah. like i i'm not equipped to be jaded or to think that i'm anything other than i am um and i appreciate everybody who's willing to work with me and i'm mm-hmm. excited about all my pro- i don't i don't know that's just my personality you know like i got a super cool family um and i'm and it's all made because of this and um yeah the fact that i woke up this morning and i'm drawing like super cool stuff uh and i'm still drawing stuff like you know like that i started when i was you know telling you about my history class i'm still I, I'm still doing the same thing I did in history class in grade eight, right? Yes. I read something, draw pictures, everybody looks at it and they go, that's cool, you know? And like, it, no, and it's, it's never, serious. ever going to get old, right? Like you never, I'm sure you've had like fatigue, but I don't think it's the art and the creative process that's been fatigue. It's in other factors and just life and being human in general. Yeah. But um, it's just weird. Well, I say weird, it's fascinating how that passion, that drive and that like what what's enjoyable, it never decays, it never ages. It almost like enriches over time um you mentioned ridley scott earlier like he's and spielberg they're knocking on 80 or they've hit 80 yeah, and they're still yeah. working probably yeah. like more hours in a day that a 60 year old would for example yeah. and it's just that to me like kind of like sounds cool like i'm i'll be if it's this if it's a creative job i'd happily work until i can't move anymore well that's what i said i don't i don't plan on not doing this you know like i don't like i you know i'm 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 more particular now right um, you know, I've, I've went through that stage of my career. I took all the jobs I shouldn't have taken mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I've done on that. Um, the amount of work I've done over my life has, has offered me kind of cooler projects with people. So I, again, I appreciate all that, but I can't imagine not talking to, like I said, I, I, the script comes across. Go, wow. That's so cool. This director's great. Let's make this thing. Let's see what happens. Like, like, like it's just, just it's just great to be part of that that sort of process i think it's good for your brain um i and 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 i think and i may be wrong i think that what i do for a living in in the entertainment industry i think i tend to avoid a lot of the things that people burn out from and people might say oh how do you not get burned out doing like you know 100 drawings a day right Mm -hmm. um I don't, it, but you're not doing 100 drawings a day. You're, like I said, you're doing this gesture. You're just figuring something mm. out, right? We also have, in storyboarding, we have this little clause, like what I call the it's good enough phase, right? Like where like, like you've told enough of the story. You've told enough that it can get down to the next part of the line, right? So you don't have to worry about all the nuts and the bolts, right? Like sometimes you can do a five-second sketch that's good enough right? Yes. Um, so I don't find, I don't, I, like I said, I don't find much friction between myself and the people I work with. I find it, mm-hmm. it's, 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 uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's a personality thing or if, you know, maybe I know some storyboard artists can get burnt out and it can be pretty brutal, but um, yeah, I, I, I still really like it a lot. <laughs> Sick. And I think, I guess it's like, it's definitely going to be different for every everybody like everyone's like the different personality types and what they but they kind of can't do like you know even something simple as like some people early birds some people want to work yeah. through the night and it could be just as simple as that yeah but like about about, about, about scripts for example and the stuff you work on you're like at the beginning phase and you see everything yeah. i'm sure it's different from the from the moment you storyboard it to how it's released and comes out yeah but does that ruin the movie going experience for you uh because you've seen the film almost. Yeah. Well, you yeah. Have. Like, I, I, I'd lie and you've to lived you. it and you've kind of like, you know, you've experienced what the characters are going through and all of that. Okay. So um, I was just talking about working with Craig Gillespie on Cruella, right? I have not seen it. I have not seen it. And I worked, I don't know how long I worked on that movie. Um, yeah. And I hear it's fantastic. I think they, they got greenlit to do a second one. 
Um, I just hadn't got around to, to, to sort of seeing it. Um, I like, I love movies, of course. I like them a lot, but there's something about working on them that's just like more awesome because mm. you get to see all the cool stuff that happens, right? Like you get to, you get to see the stuff that didn't happen. You get to see how you got to this place. Um, um, the discussions are stimulating. Um, it can be exciting. It can be deflating. You feel like you've lived that movie for six months or three months or however yeah. long you've, you've worked on it, right? I mean, not that I don't like to see it in the end. Um, of course I do. Um, because sometimes you go like, oh man, that's way better than what I came up with. Mm -hmm. You know, like, especially if you're doing something that's, uh, uh, that's heavily animated, you, you do the stuff and then you get to see those guys down that pipeline who are freaking ultra talented and you just go, like, holy shit, that's amazing. <laughs> you know, like that's, that's, that's really fun to see how talented everyone is right to the end. You know, wow. even, even the people, what I appreciate um, getting back to working on something like Love, Death, and Robots, even how they distribute that stuff and how they create a buzz, like even their marketing team, even the people at Blur who who run all that other stuff after, like after post, the post post stuff, mm -hmm. freaking <laughs> yeah. super talented, like just unbelievable. Um, it's one thing making something, then it's another thing to get people to see it, you know? Yes. Um, that is true. You know, so the, whole, that, yeah, the, the whole machine of it. Yeah, it's really, especially when I, I don't know much about anything. So to see those people understand how to get eyeballs on stuff. And I'm not talking about doing anything, you know, that's, that's not, you know, that's, you know, they're not hacking people's accounts or sending, but like, just to see how, how they can take that next thing. Like I hear a lot of people go like, oh, I'm working on my own project or I'm doing all this thing. And that's amazing. I wish I could do it. But then in the back of my mind, I go, but then you got to get people to see it, right? Mm. And that's freaking hard, man. That's really, especially these days, that is really, really hard to get people to see it because you have a thin window, a thin window. Like, you know, the video game industry, they have like how many weeks to make all their money back, right? Like it's really short. Same with films, yes. right? Yes. You know, you know so, um, so the people who do all that I blow my mind. And like, they just like, I just like, I talk to them sometimes and you just go like, holy shit, man, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's, it's true. And as, as, a, as your career has shown, like you've seen a lot of changes in terms mm -hmm. of not just mediums, but in terms of how things are approached. And yeah. I'm sure like how much attention was given to things that had yeah. probably waned and maybe some things have increased. Um, yeah. Like what things would you say have improved for the better? And what would you say things have changed maybe for the worst that you kind of wish they were from before? Um, I think, I think what we're doing now, the ability to sort of work globally, um, um, the ability to create and um, do things that you just couldn't do before digitally, right? Like on, in games, in film, like all that technology has, you know, made it uh, amazing. Um, in fact, I can sit here uh, you know, in my studio and work with people all around the world, right? Like is like we all do now is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, I do sometimes lament that I feel that in the second, third Renaissance of, of art that we're kind of moving into stuff that's so digital now that it becomes very, inhumane or inhuman and i don't know who's done it like you know mm -hmm. i grew up in i i entered this industry where you go that's a craig mullins that's a spark that's a jamie jones like that's you know rob right like you knew all those guys mm -hmm. and now that the technology coming you just you don't see the personality as much you don't see the you don't see the sausage sort of being made mm -hmm. as much <laughs> Um, and I understand why I understand because, you know, that's the, that's the way the technology is, but from somebody who likes to just draw stuff, I, like, I, I like to me, there's like, I don't know if you can see the background. I have a ton, like most of us, tons of art books, making of books. Now I'm a little disappointed when I get a making of book where it's just all super high res, high fidelity, yeah. um, renders that look exactly like what's in the film or in the game. Right. Yeah. I like seeing, you know, to use the term, the, the, the napkin doodle, 
or the, the little sketches Precisely, or, yes. or, or, you know, the digital painting of it. Right. You know, like I, I, the good, that's just me. I like, I love that stuff. Mm-hmm. That's what I do. That's why I do what I do. So that's what I would lament. And without going down this whole AI thing, that's probably the, the, the part that hurts me the most is, is, is beautiful. The, the art I'm seeing personally, I immediately can tell that there's nothing in it. Like it's very empty. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't question anything I see in it. Right. I don't go, why would the artist do that? Or why did they, all those nuanced questions we ask in our head um, where you go, that's, that's, a, that's super clever or, you know um, yeah. So, but having said that, look at, look at what we're doing right now or look at, how amazing, you know, the, the games and films and all that stuff can be made. So it's, it's the proverbial double-edged sword, right? Very true. Very true. And I wouldn't be working working with all these people if it wasn't for this technology, it wasn't for computers Mm -hmm. and the internet. And, you know, so I can't, you know, I, I can't be hypocritical. That's for sure. Uh, Yeah, I guess so. Maybe, Hypocrit- hypocritical is too strong of, of a word in my opinion but I, I totally get where you're coming from because there is like the double-edged sword is a perfect perfect example because you you can't have one without the other they the, the yeah. come as, as the package and a lot of it what influences it is a what people really want what people push towards them um almost yeah. like and at the same time you can only have what's on the menu um very rarely yeah. would you get what's off the menu and if you do request it you might not always get it as well. Um, yeah. But like, what's your kind of like, and you kind of touched upon it a little bit there, but what's your take on AI? Like, how do you, obviously there's a big, been a big, big whole thing about the ethical side of things. Like, just to yeah. give you my uh, crash, crash, I guess, like explanation on my experiences of it. I, I thought it was really cool when I started dabbling into it. I thought it was a legitimate yeah. thing. I thought, okay, this is interesting. This is cool. Yeah. I also liked it when it was a bit crappy because you yeah. see how that can be yeah. brought into life and where you can take it to other places. Yeah. I really yeah. didn't like it when it became very almost click and it's done. Like, oh no, yeah. forget that. Um, but then yeah. at the same time, the whole ethics side of things and how these tools were built and then the people behind them and how they didn't really, in my opinion, give a shit about artists. And that's fair enough. People don't have to value what artists do, but when you're trying to steal off them at the same time, that that's yeah. not cool at all. Um, and obviously you kind of feel like, even though you don't know artists, you know artists. And you kind of like, you definitely want to protect the artistry behind that kind of thing. Yeah. But then I, at the I same mean, time, like with, um, sorry, uh, a chat GPT yeah. and all this kind of stuff. And I like, it's just, it's going to be the thing now where it's constantly pushed. And if it's rejected, there's going to be another version and it's going to be coming and coming and coming. What's your take on all of this AI stuff? Um, AI, I AI. mean, you know, I compare it a lot of the things that people say and I've read and I mean, Aaron, I'm the first to admit, I don't know a whole lot about the technology. Um, so I, I can't, I can't do any sort of moral equivalency of, you know, that's how the human brain works. And I don't, I don't know any of that. Um, uh, but like what, what I see is, um, yeah, I, I believe I've read enough now where I believe all that, those, those data sets, were to quote the guy, you know, don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. Right. And, um, you know, I don't like that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty stand up guy, you know, like I pay my taxes and, you know, I, I, you know, I raise my kids. Right. And, and, and I don't like that. It's been a struggle to understand the vitriol towards us. Um, you know, I've, we've all gone through our career, like you even said, where people go, why are you doing this for a living? Suddenly everybody wants to do what we do for a living. Like it's, the, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's the, it's the thing. But I think like, I look at it two ways. I look at it personally. So I feel like, uh, like I said, I, 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 I want to keep doing this. Right. So I hope I can keep doing this. I hope like, you know, whether the tool helps me or I don't need it, I just want to keep working with directors and I want to keep drawing. Like I like, mm. there's part of my brain that like, I like to draw. <laughs> it's just, it feels good. Right. Um, and then the other part of me, I feel, I feel a lot of questions for younger artists, right? Like we've been talking about our journeys. Um, are they going to be able to go through that? Like, you know, I'm hearing a lot of kids who are really deflated by it. And, um, or if they start using it, are they even going to learn anything? You know? Um, so I don't know. I don't know where that's all going to, going to net out. So mm-hmm. like if it didn't happen, I probably would be happier. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, but it is going to be what it is. And um, I guess we all just got to kind of like one of the one of the things people say all the time and I'm paraphrasing is they go, well, you know, you got to, you know, it's, it's coming. So you got to prepare for it. What does that even look like? Like what is preparing for it mean? Yeah, that's true. And they all say that and I go, but what, how, what, like, like, what does that look like? We don't know what this is going to look like. Does it mean preparing that I've got to use it all the time? Like, is it, is it prepared that I've got to go learn to do something else or be sad because, you know, people aren't drawing yeah. anymore? I don't know. But I, don't know. I think you kind of like mentioned something there, which I think, obviously, I could be wrong because a lot of people have said about it over the weeks even, where they thought, oh, it's going to get to this level in a year or so and it kind of change in the three weeks or in a month or so. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I'll, be in, I'll be very surprised if it is able to instill that feeling that there's someone behind it like you mentioned that yeah. soul like yeah. that's something that i like when i see ai art now it's it's definitely visually cool like you know yeah it's great um yeah. obviously how how it's built it's going to be because it's off the backs of art it's actually make real art yeah. but you nailed it i always look and i think this is there's something empty about it there's something soulless yeah. about it no matter how good it looks yeah. and it's interesting that how that happens and yeah. it's almost like we we know when someone's made something naturally yeah. and organically and properly. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's still going to be a key thing. And even if it does become the norm and everyone does it, people will slowly start looking at it and thinking, we mentioned music off um, before we began. And yeah. I've, I'm someone who makes things digitally and yeah. it's cool, but yeah. I always pine for wanting to be able to do things properly. Yeah, like yeah. Learn how to play an instrument, learn music, learn all that kind of stuff. And maybe that's how it's going to be with this stuff as well, because there are going to be a gen- is there is going to be a generation for sure who yeah. this is their gateway into art, not a pen yeah, and yeah, paper yeah. like it was for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, it's going to be prompting. Yeah, yeah. I just hope I just hope it become it just you know my dream is that it makes the industry more robust and healthier, mm. and 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 people like myself can thrive in it and still find whatever it is we find when we, we, we like to, to sit down and draw. Like I've, I've watched enough um, videos on screen of, of guys using extensions and plugins for stable diffusion. And, you know, it looks like they're trying to land the space shuttle. It doesn't look remotely, <laughs> um, rem- like doesn't look like you're using any part of the brain that you and I use yeah. when we draw stuff. Right. And, True. Yeah. And, and so to me, it's not about, oh, we got, it's all about, you know, reducing the friction they like to say or or whatever but there's part of my brain i use when i draw that i know i won't use if i'm trying to prompt something or i'm trying yeah. to uh, you know use you know what's everyone using control net now doing all that mm-hmm. stuff it just seems counterintuitive to what allows me to sit here for 8 10 12 hours a day and just that sort of cool thing that goes on in your head you're making these micro decisions right like you're you're drawing you and you're like if you could have an eyeball tracker, you're looking around the frame and you're, you're balancing things out and you're, you're, you know, you're disgusted with what you just did there and you're racing it. And, and that's a process. You don't get bored of that. Yeah. Right. Like yes. sitting there and trying to prompt something and then figure out what I need to remove from the prompt or how I need to weight that prompt. I know I'm not going to be super jazzed doing that, you know, and, you know, and then yeah. see what it looks like, you know? Um, yeah. I think that's, that's, that's more that's like, I mean, I'm pretty sure over time it will be given or find its own definition. I yeah. guess like how cosplay is like its own thing, which yeah. is an extraction adaptation of something that exists, but it's something else at the same time, but yeah. it's still considered legitimate because people like doing it. Yeah. Um, and maybe it is that maybe it's more of a, a tech thing that yeah. is being confused with art perhaps. Um, and maybe it'll just become its own thing because I, I do feel that although... Initially, it's, gonna, it's artists that have been at the brunt of taking the brunt of this AI stuff. It's gonna, it's working oh, its way, right? like oh. like you know, the Night King and his yeah, horde yeah. of White Walkers through the whole yeah. of the kingdom. And it's gonna yeah. be in where well, it's already copywriting and stories and whatever else. And I'm sure there's gonna be great things about it. Like yeah. it's a shame that this isn't used and making breakthroughs in health. I'm sure it will be. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that where it's gonna be cherished the most. But yeah. there's all gonna be a lot of trashy stuff as well. But what's not trashy is your work and storyboarding in general. Um, and a few, I guess, anecdotes from yourself before we wrap up. For artists and people who 
want to be storyboard artists as well and just work in this realm. Like I've been fortunate enough to be hired to do some storyboard stuff, but not not that's not my main thing. And nowhere near as prolific as yourself. Yeah. And when I see stuff like you've done, it's just it's yeah, like I love it. I'm a fan and yeah. it's great. But for students who want to do this day in, day out, like yourself, like this is what they want to do. Yeah. What would you recommend for them to focus on, keep an eye on, and be careful of? Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's the obvious stuff, right? So you 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 understand film, right? You, under, you try to understand production, right? So there's a lot of great books on directing and 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 all that, and you and you work on your drawing. Um, I think first and foremost, uh, I think people have to have to decide is this what they want to do, right? Because mm-hmm. we're kind of an odd bunch. We live in a weird little environment, like. We hang around with all the cool concept guys, right? You know, we're always that page 94 in the art of book, you know, like even though we board the whole movie, this is my big beef, right? Even though we, we board the entire movie, the whole story, we figure out all the gags, all the stunts, there'll be eight pages of somebody's cape or a pair of boots. They go through iteration after iteration and uh, we get like, we get like that one page. Um, so you gotta you gotta decide that you know you're you're gonna you're gonna kind of dwell in the dark corners of things and you're gonna be asked to do a lot of bad drawing and in huge quantities of drawing um, and you're not gonna be a superstar um, with the exception of you nobody wants to talk to you um, and you'll you'll hang out in our weird little groups <laughs> um, so you have to kind of brace yourself for that right that this is this really strange little world. Um, but then you have to understand that what we do is super important, right? So it is not about drawing beautiful pictures or pretty pictures, right? Or I like this particular genre. I, I want to draw for this genre. You're not designing stuff. You're not designing characters. You're not designing environments. You're, you're actually helping with story structure. You're actually helping production. Like you're not just helping the director and tell the story. You're helping the producers, the line producers, the guys in VFX. You're helping everybody, right? So so you you have to be prepared to start to understand that um and then then you can start to layer in the fun stuff like i i like like i like to draw so i want my stuff to emote i want to act mm-hmm. right like it's like it's the it's, it's the old saying a stick figure is fine right it'll work for a storyboard right because everybody can see where things go but if i can put something in front of you and you go oh shit this is gonna be good this is gonna be so cool i love the light on <laughs> that then then you start to move up, right? So just just keep in mind what what storyboarding is, right? It is drawing, but it's not its main purpose. That's that's what I would tell people. So so look look to learn those disciplines, understand those disciplines about all that stuff: blocking cameras, lensing, reading a script, breaking it down. And that'll come with time. You know, you fall on your face a million times for sure. You know, so you know you don't need to know all that right away. You know, producers and directors will point out your flaws early on <laughs> <laughs> Dan that's amazing and I really appreciate you jumping on yeah. and just being honest about your journey like just for me and I'm sure for everyone who's listening as well like this has been this has been profound there's a uh, lot of stuff that you said that has really connected and put things back in perspective that maybe you're kind of like you know like, like a very bad spine which I'm sure a lot of us have yeah, sure. discs and stuff it's kind of like you know corrected all that kind of stuff but um yeah. I really appreciate that. Um, where can people find you? And is there anything you want to plug? Um, um, I have a I have a website. I have an Instagram page. Uh, I have an art station page still. Um, and um, yeah, that's kind of that's that's kind of it. You know, I I try to post stuff up. I can like like a lot of us we get under NDAs for a bunch of years and stuff. Um, Everything, everything I post is usually just kind of around, around my work or how I feel or stuff like that. So, um, but I'm always, uh, I'm happy to answer questions. I get a lot of questions from students um, and, I'm, you know, I love answering them because a lot of people answer questions for me. Um, and like I said, storyboarding is weird. It's, 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 a, it's a weird thing. Um, and there's not a lot of really good information out there. So, uh, so yeah, happy to help out anyone who's interested in it, you know. Um, and I should I should point out I'm not even though I work on animation I would not say I'm a story artist an animation guy like I you know like I don't work for Disney or even though I, I work for Disney and, and but, yeah. but I, I'm not I'm not that guy right I'm not going to be doing Toy <laughs> Story five right so so that seems to be what a lot of people like in storyboarding like a lot of people want to storyboard for full animation. I just mm. don't.
I don't have those chunks. But, but there it is. Fair enough. Dan, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and I'm sure we'll speak again soon. Yeah, Aaron, thanks for reaching out. It's been super fun. A massive thanks to Dan for a truly inspiring conversation and really being honest about his experiences and sharing that with us. Hit the links to give him a follow and see what he's up to. And then head on over to learnsquared.com and start your creative journey today. Till next time.